It's a Thursday edition of PFTOT. I, I know there's no PFT live for which this can be PFTOT, but you know the drill by now. And we've got another week or so of this before PFT live returns on July 29. And on that day, the NFL and the NFL Players Association will be getting together for the next time to continue their discussions toward a new collective bargaining agreement. This is a strange development from Wednesday because the two sides were due to get together for three days of CBA discussions. The first day, Wednesday, abruptly, mid to late afternoon, the two sides issued a joint statement indicating that the talks are already over, that they're very productive, beneficial to both sides, but they don't have anything further to talk about, and they're going to cancel Thursday and Friday and get back together again, reportedly on July 29. And I, I understand that the news is the news, and the joint statement is the joint statement, and we can either take it at face value or we can probe a little bit more deeply, and I choose to probe a little bit more deeply and wonder what in the world really is going on here. You've got the NFL wanting to get a deal done by the start of the regular season. More on that coming up in a moment. And you've got some real issues that you need to work through if they're ever going to get a deal done. Yeah, there are some incidental issues, little things that they need to talk through. But the big issues, and the two big issues in my view, are how the revenue ultimately is going to be split and how much money gets taken off the top for stadium credits before they do the split. Because obviously, the more money that the NFL siphons off the top to pay for stadium construction and renovation, the less money is available to split between the two sides. Those are the two issues. And you know, I look at it this way. If we couch this as an extension, well, it's not really an extension in the sense that both sides say, hey, everything is working well. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. They're coming to the bargaining table, and they are focusing on big questions like whether and to what extent the current revenue split should be changed, whether and to what extent the current allowances for stadium credits should be adjusted. These are significant issues. And at some point, there's going to be some acrimony. There's going to be some hard feelings. There's going to be some tough arguments and moments in the negotiating room. And, and I'm starting to think that the two sides are creating a false impression that everything is well just because they realize it's not in anyone's interests to create the impression that things aren't going well, that if they can maintain this idea that it's all very smooth, it's all very simple, it's all very normal, while they fight it out privately, then the football fan doesn't freak out about the possibility of another lockout. Now, I don't know that that's sustainable, and I, I kind of wonder, and this is just my idea, this is just my thought based upon the circumstances, that they got together on Wednesday and they began for the first time to talk about real issues and realized, well, we got some real issues here. Before we spend the next three days beating the hell out of each other, let's just press pause on this and let's get back together on July 29, coincidentally or not, when the members of the executive committee who have jobs with NFL teams are in training camp. And that reduces the overall potential for friction. The fewer people you have negotiating, the less the chance that one person is going to get upset by something that someone the other side may have to say. So I, I think that, that before they got to the point where the crap hit the fan on Wednesday, they recognized Let's call this productive. Let's call this beneficial. Let's call it a day. Let's not get together Thursday or Friday. Let's get together on the 29th day of July. And maybe that's the moment when they'll bloody each other up a little bit, but act to the rest of us like everything is still going very well. Now, I've already mentioned the idea that the NFL wants to get a CBA in place by the start of the regular season. And something very interesting happened yesterday because it was just last week that the commissioner, Roger Goodell, sat down with CNBC and, among other things, he confirmed that it is certainly our intent to have a new CBA with the union in place by the start of the regular season. We had reported that weeks before. No one had ever disputed it. And here's the commissioner a week ago confirming that that is what the NFL wants. Yesterday, in the aftermath of this 
one day only when three days were set aside bargaining session with the joint statement that everything is fine. Mike Garofolo, who works for the NFL, and, and I know that people who work at NFL media don't really like it when I say they work for the NFL, but spoiler alert, they do. When Garofolo says that the NFL really isn't pushing all that hard to get the deal done by the start of the regular season, I, it, just a week ago, the commissioner said that's our intent. That's certainly our intent. So what what's going on here? And, you know, the bigger picture reality, and I'll try to choose my words a little bit carefully. I just think that if you're going to go to NFL Network or NFL.com for news about the NFL-NFLPA collective bargaining agreement discussions, you have to view that news and any opinions articulated at those locations through the prism that you're getting it all from NFL employees. And... You know, if your sources in the league office are telling you, hey, this is what's going on, are you going to say that, you know what, maybe that's not really what's going on? Maybe they're not telling us the truth. Are you really going to do that? Are you going to impugn the credibility and the truthfulness of people who, like you, are having their paychecks signed by Roger Goodell? Or are you going to impugn the credibility and the overall trustworthiness of the commissioner if he talks about these issues and maybe the circumstances suggest that something else is going on. So anyway, here's the point. I don't know how carefully I chose my words, but I don't care. Here's the point. I think the NFL does want to get a CBA in place by the start of the regular season, but they're starting to recognize it's not going to be easy to do. And sure, if they can get one done on their terms by the start of the regular season, fine. But I don't think they're going to get one done on their terms by the start of the regular season because the union is smart enough to realize, hey, if the NFL wants to get this done by the start of the regular season and we don't really care, we've got leverage. We, we, we can say you have to give us a premium. You have to give us more than you otherwise would give us because you're the ones who want to get this done. So now I think the NFL is trying to back off from this idea that they want to get it done because they're recognizing, yeah, the, the union's smart enough to know that the price goes up on a new CBA If we're the ones who want to get this done by the start of the regular season and they really don't care one way or the other whether or not the deal is done by the time the Packers and the Bears kick off on NBC on the evening of September 5. The Denver Broncos have kicked off training camp. They're the first team to get together. And it looked like quarterback Drew Locke, the 42nd overall pick in the draft, was going to be a holdout. And I guess technically he was for a little bit. But they got that deal done yesterday afternoon. Now, there was a report that Drew Locke's agents were looking for a quarterback premium. I'm told that they really weren't. They were pushing. They were negotiating. But they weren't going to hold out. And see, the, the one thing about all this that we need to keep in mind, the player ultimately decides when he's going to show up or not show up. And sometimes the player defers completely and totally to the agent. And sometimes the player says, look, I don't care what you do. Do the best possible deal you can, but I'm showing up. I want to be there. I want to practice and I want to compete and prepare myself to be the starting quarterback, whether I beat out Joe Flacco or whether Joe Flacco gets injured and I need to be ready to go. So, you know, I think an effort was made to maybe get him a little bit more given that he is a quarterback and given that most people thought he should have been a first round pick and he slid down to pick number 42 and you know the agents doing the best possible deal but they ultimately got the best offer they could on the table which involved some workout bonuses in 2021 and 2022 that shifts some money around gets him some money sooner than he otherwise would have gotten it and you know at the end of the day Drew Locke still gets the same dollar figure he would have gotten because these deals are now all formulaic It's all determined ahead of time what you're going to get based upon your slot. There isn't a whole lot that can be negotiated. Cash flow, guarantee, et cetera. And at the end of the day, some improved cash flow for Drew Locke. But the good news for the Broncos, he's in camp, he's ready to go. And they'll they'll see whether or not they've finally taken care of their quarterback issues. The L.A. Chargers have a running back issue that is still lingering. Melvin Gordon wants more money. He most recently said his teammates have his back. Well, I can think of one teammate that that doesn't have his back, and that teammate would be uh, Austin Eckler, the backup running back who stands to become the the number one running back if Melvin Gordon does indeed make good on his threat to hold out. And and when you look at the drop off, is there even a drop off from Melvin Gordon to Austin Eckler? I really don't know. Peter Schaefer, an agent who has represented multiple running backs over the course of his career, and he's spearheading this idea to reverse the devaluing of the running back position. 
you know, his, his argument is there are certain running backs that will force a defense to do something differently. I don't know that Melvin Gordon is a guy that forces a defense to do something differently than what they're already going to do. I think a team that's getting ready to play the Chargers is going to approach it the same way if Gordon's the running back versus Austin Eckler, period. You're not reconfiguring the defense to stop Gordon any more than you're, than you're reconfiguring the defense to stop Eckler. So, look, G Gordon needs to be careful here. And, and uh, let me reiterate. I love it when a guy stands up to the system. I love it when a guy tries to disrupt the way that NFL teams try to dictate the way things should be done. But you got to have leverage. you got to have good standing. You've got to be a guy who the team says, oh, crap, we can't go forward without this player. A point I made yesterday at PFT, Anthony Lynn, the head coach of the Chargers, a former running backs coach, a former NFL running back. I think he knows special when he sees it. And if Anthony Lynn believed that Melvin Gordon's absence was in some way going to derail the fate and the fortunes of the 2019 L.A. Chargers, we probably wouldn't be at this point where Melvin Gordon has to threaten a holdout. By now, Anthony Lynn would have used his leverage, leverage that he surely has amassed based upon his great performance as the coach of the team so far, and stood up in a meeting room with Tom Telesco, the GM of the team, or with the Spanos family, and said, we got to pay Melvin Gordon. I know a great running back when I see one. We have a great running back. Let's pay him. That hasn't happened. Or if it's happened, Anthony Lynn has failed to get the message across. Either way, Melvin Gordon could end up being the next Maurice Jones-Drew. And not in a good way, because it was in 2012 that Jones Drew held out for all of training camp, all of the preseason. It was at Labor Day weekend that he realized, you know what? They're not giving me a new contract. They're not going to change anything. I better just show up and go back and play football. And that could be what Melvin Gordon does. And if that's the end result, nobody benefits from that, least of which is Melvin Gordon, because he'll be starting the season woefully unprepared relative to how prepared he could have been if he would have been there for training camp in the preseason. One guy who says that he will be showing up for the start of training camp is Falcons receiver Julio Jones. Now, the Falcons report on the 21st, so that's just a few days away. They're getting ready to face the Broncos in the Hall of Fame game. They get extra time for training camp, but that shortens the deadline for when Jones needs to be there and, more importantly, when the Falcons need to get a deal done with Jones. And, and look what the Falcons have done recently. They did a beat-the-clock deal with Grady Jarrett on Monday before the deadline came and went for signing franchise tag players to long-term deals. And then on Wednesday, Deion Jones gets a new contract. So does Julio Jones get his new contract before the 21st? He, he, has, he has said, hey, Arthur Blank, the owner of the team, has given me his word that we're going to get this done. Well, it's one thing for the Falcons to want to get it done. It's another thing for the Falcons to give in to whatever it is that Julio Jones wants. And, and that's the bottom line here. It's not a blank check. Hey, yeah, we'll gladly sign you to a new contract if you accept our terms. But we're not going to give in to what you want simply because you want that much money. We want to give you a new deal. You don't want to take the deal we want to give you. So... Let's keep an eye on this one. Last year, remember, it looked like Julio Jones was going to hold out. They moved some money around to placate him. But the thinking always was, by this year, he would get that next contract. And the challenge for the Falcons is very simple. The Falcons know that they've probably already gotten the best of Julio Jones. So how much do you pay a guy for what he's already done. That runs counter to everything we've heard about the NFL in the last 25 years. With the advent of the salary cap and free agency, the NFL became a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately league, or more accurately, what are you doing for me right now, and what can I expect you to do for me tomorrow? That's what teams pay for. Julio Jones, I think, to a certain degree, wants to get paid for past performance, wants to get paid for the fact that maybe he hasn't gotten paid as much as he should have gotten paid during those years where he was truly in his prime. Now, look, he may still be very well in his prime. He could be the best receiver in the NFL this season, but he's getting closer and closer to the edge of the cliff. And the Falcons don't want to put themselves in position where they have paid a ton of money to a guy who isn't performing up to that dollar figure that Julio Jones apparently wants. So we'll see in the next few days whether or not they get that deal done. And we'll see you tomorrow for a Friday edition of PFTOT. Another edition of PFTPM coming this week. I'll probably do it on Friday afternoon, answer all your questions heading into really the last 
semi-slow weekend of the off season because by the following weekend all training camps will be open and the following weekend after that is the hall of fame festivities and then off we go with the nfl's 100 season so thanks as always for some of your time we'll do this again on friday hi i'm mike tarico and thanks for watching make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from nbc sports